Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Canadian Immigrant Web Conference Series uh, in partnership with Access Employment. This industry-specific web conference for internationally educated engineers, technologists, and uh, technicians uh, is being organized, as I said, by Canadian Immigrant in partnership with Access Employment. This, will, this is going to be recorded and posted on our website for those uh, who cannot attend or if you have to uh, leave early on. Um, before we kick things off, uh, let me first introduce um, myself and my colleagues. Uh, so my name is Ramya Ramanathan. I'm the editor of Canadian Immigrant Magazine. We're at CanadianImmigrant.ca and you can also find our print copies. And I'm with my colleague, Laura Jackman, who is a managing marketing for a Canadian immigrant. So we'd first like to start off by sharing a short video uh, from one of our sponsors, Western Union, who supports Canadian immigrant and allows us to run these free events and webinars across the country. So Laura will be playing the uh, Western Union video now. Thank you, Laura. So I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker from Access Employment, Rizal Halali. Rizal has uh, been with us for a few years and uh, has presented at uh, other events as well. So it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, you. Rizal will be speaking to us on the Engineering Connections Program offered by Access Employment. If you have any questions for Rizal, please uh, type it in the uh, chat by clicking the uh, Q&A buttons or just in the chat box, and uh, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. You can also email us at info at canadianimmigrant.ca. So Rizal, thanks again for joining us. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank Canadian Immigrant for organizing such a nice uh, <clears throat> series. And it is always, always very effective. And I like to share all my screen and all my experience with this. And apart from the presentation, <clears throat> I also will add some of the tips and tricks because some of you are attending this webinar from a part, from the different part of the world. So maybe you have a plan to come to Canada. So I'm not limiting my presentation with my program, but I will provide some extra information for <clears throat> people who are from other occupation as well as engineering occupation. Uh, as uh, Rana mentioned that I am with this program uh, for a long time and I am here, I work with on, I work only with the engineers for more than <clears throat> 12 years in Canada. So I, um, but fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not from engineering background, but I work with the engineers and I know the market. So from that perspective, I will share my, uh, some of my thoughts and <clears throat> reflection. I have my own agenda, <clears throat> so you can uh, see that. Uh, so first I will talk a little bit of access employment and then the program and some tips and tricks. So first of all, access employment is absolutely a non-profit organization and we are in this sector for more than 30 years. Thank you. Canada. And uh, you can see our vision and mission. We focus on employment. I think this is our specialization for the last 30 years, we do only one thing, employment, and we do it differently. Uh, there are some statistics, some people, they like the statistics. So you can see that uh, 40,000 job seekers we serve annually, and a good number of clients are uh, happy and they got employed in the respective fields. So this is a little bit of statistics at a glance based on the last year information. Uh, we provide different services. <clears throat> Uh, job search support, online services, connect, employers connection. However, the most important and very popular one is the bridging program you can see on the right side. So these are the bridging program, very sector specific for the foreign trained professional. And 
from this program, you can understand that how specialized we are on the different stream. And within this program, there are three programs which are directly for the engineers. So I will be focusing on those programs in a minute. <clears throat> So we have a webinar, online workshops. So, so if you can go, if you can visit our website, you can see there are a lot of uh, e modules, e-learning, e-learning events. So, so you can get uh, access to those e from the e-access from our website. Now, as our discussion is focused on engineering, so other than access, there are some other <coughs> organizations. So they also directly or indirectly deals with the engineers. Uh, so. The major programs right now, based on my experience in Ontario, so we have the Engineering Connections Program for the foreign trained professional. So then there is an, another program <clears throat> which is run by TRCA. And then we, there is an, another program run by JBS Toronto that is for the engineer, uh, architect only. And also the Toronto District School Board, they also have some kind of program for the engineers. So all these programs are now in place for engineers and architects. However, I will be focusing on only this program. Now, Engineering Connections program, I want to share with you that how experienced and specialized we are. We are delivering this program for the last 20 years. So now you can understand how experienced we are. Over 6,000 graduates up to now. <clears throat> and we, in this program, we have four streams. So the four streams are engineering job search program, which are for all discipline. Then we have workplace essential for engineers. Later on, you will understand the difference between uh, all this program. Then we have project management for engineers. Then uh, we have electrical engineering connections program. So these are the four main streams we have. Over 100 employers are engaged and 80% of our graduates are employed in the respective field after graduation. Then we deliver all this program in partnership with the major academic institutions and they are Humber College, Seneca College and Toronto Metropolitan University. We have strong collaboration with the EEO, Professional Engineers Ontario and this, they are the licensing authority and also we have a strong partnership with OSPI. This is a professional association onto your society of professional engineers. <clears throat> in 2018, for the first time in Canada, we established a new program, which is only for the electrical engineers. And we successfully delivered the pilot phase. Then we are in the second phase of the program. So this is the first time from the online program. Uh, now, definitely this program is successful, but sometimes people ask me, what is the secret of my success? I have only one secret, that is the support from our alumni. <clears throat> so we, we have a very strong program and process to engage our alumni. They actually support us to get the job for our new participants, mentoring, coaching, other things. So this is the beauty of this program. So mentors, I mean, the alumni is at the piece, the, uh, like the resource for us, for the success of this program. Now, <clears throat> in order to go to what the details of the program, so what lesson I learned for the last 10 years working with engineers and foreign trained professionals. So I want to share with you, maybe some of you are in Canada right now, or some of you are planning to come to Canada, but all of you will have certain level of challenges at the beginning, because life is not that smooth the way planned from abroad. Here, a little bit of hiccups you need to encounter. So what are those challenges and what I learned? The first thing you will have a challenge that is identity crisis. I call it identity crisis. Back home, you are known as an engineer, professional, professor, project manager, this and that. But when you come to Canada, when you are looking for a job, it is very difficult for you to identify yourself, who you are. So that's why it is a, sometimes it's an overwhelming situation emotionally. So it is very difficult. Sometimes this overwhelming situation lead people towards the different direction. So this is one challenge when uh, we are in Canada. And I also had this kind of situation when I came here 20 years before. <clears throat> then the second challenge is the financial pressure. It's a very expensive life in Canada. So whenever we are here, uh, 
if we do nothing at the end of the month, if I have family, then three, four thousand dollars gone. So that pressure also leads people to the different directions. So often people lose lose their focus, and that can create an extra pressure towards the end, particularly then the compromise with their career. And also the another idea is that nowadays so many ideas, so many options, somebody saying go there, somebody will say go for education, this and that, okay, forget about it, engineering, come and do anything and everything. This kind of situation is also a challenging uh, situation for the newcomers when they are looking for job. So that is why these are the things uh, when you are in Canada, you need to encounter these challenges. You need to have a nice plan to face all these challenges. Otherwise, there is a real potential risk of being lost. Then <clears throat> another challenge is the understanding the labor market because it's a labor market. Market has two elements, demand and supply, right? So when you are coming to, people prefer, uh, the newcomers prefer Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. So if you look at the Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver labor market information, there's a little bit of imbalance of supply and demand. Again, Industry-wise also, there is a preference. Okay, within the engineering, okay, civil is the number one in Ontario. So everywhere construction. Okay, what is the second one? Okay, the mechanical. The third one is made by electrical. But electrical nowadays is a <clears throat> nuclear-based power plant program projects are much, but how many people coming from abroad with nuclear-based power plant experience? So these are the things we need to understand. So those who are coming from the manufacturing background, so mechanical engineer or industrial engineer, in general, Toronto, Ontario, and Canada is not a manufacturing country. So however, you have the experience with maybe consumer good product, maybe process improvement, maybe time and motion engineering, maybe production. So when you come to Canada, you need to understand what is the labor market prospect as a mechanical engineer or as a production engineer or manufacturing engineer. Sometimes we don't analyze this information that create extra stress for us. Another uh, potential challenge is the understanding about the local code standard certification. So I used to say in engineering field, there are a lot of compliance. There is no doubt about your engineering knowledge. Nobody will challenge you about your engineering, but the challenge is how comfortable you are to comply with the local standard and codes. Say so for example, I am giving the one example, <clears throat> asphalt code in Dubai asphalt code in Canada are not the same. So this is the, the difference. Nobody's asking about engineering. So here, each and every industry, ownership, construction sector, health and safety code, Ontario building code, asphalt code, consumer, <clears throat> like if you're looking at the lean methodology, there's a, another code. If, and you need to know the, if you're from the manufacturing background, then you need to know the good manufacturing process. There are so many standards and compliance is uh, in place so that as a newcomer, I have 20 years experience, but when I look for job, I need to understand those code and standard. Otherwise employer will not be really comfortable. So this is another <coughs> challenge. Then the career roadmap is also understand. Say I managed a lot of project, million dollar project in some other country, but if, when I am landed in Canada, for the next day, I need to understand, okay, should I look for a job as a project director, project manager, or something else. I personally encourage the technical roles are most important. Technical roles you will get faster. Technical role means application of theory. So in engineering sector, there are three main stream jobs. One is the core engineering, second is the project management, and third is the technician and technologist. So you need to understand what is the appropriate roadmap for you based on your experience. Do you want to go with the core engineering or you want to go to the project management or you can think about some other licensing like electrician, plumbing, technician, technologies. There are so many options, but that line you need to draw. <clears throat> Another challenge is the job search. Like in many countries, like based on my experience nowadays when you are living abroad, so maybe job is looking for you. You need not to look for job, but when you come to Canada, you need to look for job at least for the first time. Second time, you need not to look for job, but first time you need to look for job. But how you look for job? Third party website is not the solution. Staying behind the laptop will not produce anything. So there are different ways of 
for preparing your resume, interview preparation, networking, cold calling. There are different local strategies that you need to be comfortable with to hit the market. Uh, then presentation and communication is also important. Local professional networking is also important. It is very because it's an immigrant society, so employers have, they have a little bit of challenge to understand the people. So network is very makes a big big difference. And presentation and communication is also important because I know by default engineers they don't like presentation and talking, they are serious type of personality. They like work, but in Canada, when you are in Canada, that how employer will know that you can do it. So in that case, it is important to make the presentation to verbalize what you did. So these are the challenges uh, if you know in advance and if you can plan for yourself, it will help you to integrate more smoothly. Now I'm coming to my program. So as I mentioned earlier that I, I have two different streams in, within the engineering program. The first program is known as Workplace Essential for Engineers which is currently online. My partner is Amber Collis. Next court, you can see it is <clears throat> those people who need further language improvement and communication skills development. This, this program is for them. It's a free of cost funded by uh, federal government. And <clears throat> then I have another stream, which is called Job Search for Engineers. Uh, it's a six weeks full time full time program, but online. My partner is academia partner is Humber College and Seneca College. It's a free of cost, and you can take the screenshot. There's a web link, so you can go to our website. You can look about it. These two program is open for any engineering discipline, civil, mechanical, industrial, anything. So these are considered as a job search program for the engineer, but it's a little general program. Then next pro stream is, the, we, I, we call it project management for engineers. It is also online. It's an eight weeks full-time program. <clears throat> it is funded by the Ontario government and there's a little tuition fee for that $400 plus tax, but people can get refund if they're accept, accepted to the program. And this program is delivered in partnership with the Toronto University. And remember this is a management for the management people, those who like to pursue their PMP designation. This is exactly the PMP exam preparation course. And if someone is completing this program, they will get the 35 hours of PDU, professional development unit, which will satisfy PMI. And then next, they can go for the PMP exam directly. So the next pro stream is the electrical engineering connections program. This is a very different kind of program. And it's a nine weeks program and it's online from the very beginning. And the beauty of this program, it is totally delivered from LMS and it is has, it has a self-study and all the evening uh, live sessions will be in the evening. The Humber College will be teaching around 110 hours of different uh, module. You will learn about that. And it has tuition fee for $500 and then people can can refund if they're acceptable to the program. <clears throat> and the this is the beauty, this is the self-study and then live session in the evening because we understand sometimes people are working so they need to focus on their income as well as they need to grow. Within all the system covers two types of programs, two types of contents or topics, job search topics and job search topics are typically it is, uh, these are the topics we cover, uh, resume, labor market, call calling, communication, problem solving, your licensing and others, and the engineering topics that we cover in the general engineering topics, we cover ethics and law on the building code, health and safety code, basics of supervision, estimation, MS project and lead. So these are reaching regular general topics. And then for the project management for engineering streams, we cover special item for the management, which is our fundamentals and concept of project, agile, integration management, PMI code and ethics, PMP exam preparation, contracting, and cost engineering plus risk management. So these are the engineering topics under PME program, engineering project management program. For the electrical engineering program, the technical topics are health and safety code and standards, application of measuring unit, electric code, fire code, industrial automation, energy system, 
renewable energy and building information modeling. So these are the specialized topics for the electrical engineering programs. <clears throat> Other than these two types of engineering and job search topics, what else we do? We provide one-on-one -on -one coaching and support for the employment. Then uh, people, when they are in our program, they will have access extended access for LinkedIn learning. Typically as an independent user, we have 30 days, but if someone is attending our program, they will get three months access to the LinkedIn learning. Plus IBM Skill Build is another platform. There are hundreds and thousands of programs, free programs. So if people are attending our program, they will have access to the Skill Build learning platform as well. Plus we organize webinar mentoring and recruitment because ultimate performance indicator for these projects are the employment. So how many people got the job? So that's my deliverable. Uh, we also have the business schools and language schools. They are from the industry professionals. So they will be working with our participant one-on-one -on -one basis to provide the industry specific coaching and supporting them to integrate into the engineering labor market. Uh, eligibility wise for the engineering connections program and the workplace connections program, it's so pretty much same because this is funded by the federal government. We will look at power and resident and conventional refugee, minimum one year of experience from abroad, international degree or diploma. And for this stream, we need language benchmark seven uh, and above, but for this stream, five and six, language benchmark five and six is perfect. For the project management and the electrical engineering criteria are the same because these, pro these two programs are funded by the Ontario government. So here is a little bit of flexibility, permanent resident, naturalized Canadian citizen, conventional refugee, refugee claimant with work permit. And, but in electrical engineering, the people must live in Ontario, but here the people can live in the greater Toronto area and Hamilton area. Work experience two years, that's fine, bachelor degree, seven and above is the language benchmark. So these are the typical eligibility criteria for these programs. Now I want to give a pause here. So I shared my program, I gave my initial challenges, but at this time I want to take the opportunity to give you something that you do when you're coming to Canada and to get settled. <clears throat> As an engineering professional or any other professional, <clears throat> uh, this is something I want to share with you. Stay, first thing, stay focused. You delivered various projects in your life as an engineer or as a project manager. So why not you take your job search as a project, create a scope of work, allocate resource, monitor your progress, and then move forward. And also you need to increase your local professional network. Networks can make a significant difference. And also please <clears throat> know your regulatory requirement. Some of you will go to the PEO, some of you will go to the OSP and some of you will be learning about OSA today and the PMI website. Learn about the different requirement, industry specific requirement to make you comfortable so that you know what you're looking for. And also explore alternative roadmap within the, your occupation. Use transferable skills. Say for example, someone is coming from say Middle East from mechanical oil and gas engineer mechanical engineer from oil and gas industry. You came to Toronto. So where is the oil and gas industry in Toronto? Nothing. You have only one place in Sarnia. It's a far, far west. So now if you are an oil and gas petroleum engineer, if you come to Toronto, then you look for a job as a petroleum engineer, it is difficult. So in that case, you need to transfer your skill and you need to focus on other industry. <clears throat> so that is something you need to talk to different kind of expert that, okay, how you can bring your transferable skill and work in other industry because in Toronto, there is no oil and gas field. <clears throat> Same thing with other occupation. Say someone is from oceanography engineer or avionics engineering. If you land in Toronto, so where is the job as an oceanography engineer? Either you need to go to Halifax or New Brunswick or Vancouver. But if you want to stay in Toronto, then you need to look for some alternative. Uh, I personally don't encourage foreign trained professionals when you come to Canada. When you come to Canada, maybe some of your friends will say, okay, go for higher education. No, education will not solve the problem. Here, how many jobs in Canada requires master's and PhD? Very few. 
but you need to upgrade your skills. Say if you say I am a 20 years experience in project management, construction project management or business management, then the second question I will ask you, okay, what planning software did you use before? Now, if you say MS project, then I will say you are a general person. You need to be comfortable with the Primavera. Or then you need to be comfortable with Agile. So if you need a project management role in here, then you need, it is your responsibility to upgrade your software skills. If you know about the PLC, then okay, SCADA, PLC, or process improvement. In any field, there is some kind of technical skills needed. So you, it is your obligation. If you say, I manage billion dollar project, I don't care. Do you know Primavera? No, thank you very much. So these are the things you need to understand. As I mentioned earlier, so job search is a very different thing here. So you need to do strategize your job search. Applying third party through the third party jobs website will not work. You need to connect with the people, different thing, LinkedIn, this and that. And also when you are looking for job, please, please be extra mindful of your social media presence. Because nowadays, employer look at your social media existence or so social media affiliation. So be extra careful. I, I have seen a lot of problem with nowadays with the social media presence when you're looking for a job. Plus, <clears throat> very important thing I want to share with you. Remember, Canada needs a specialist. Canada is not a land of a generalist. If you say I'm a construction engineer, I can construct anything and everything, I will say, thank you. I cannot, I don't need you. You need to draw your line. Okay, I'm a construction specialist. I'm a construction management professional specialized on highway or tunnel or pavement or highways or lorries or ICA project or concrete structure or steel structure. Somehow you need to draw the line. Remember, Canada is not for generalist. That is why you need to be very strong. And I call them, okay, doesn't matter what is your engineering background, when you landed in Canada from the next day, you need to be a sales, you need to like a sales engineer. Soft skills are equally important in hard skills. People will not challenge with your hard skills because hard skills, you whatever you wrote in your resume, I trust you for the first time. But it is important when I will talk to you, when I will observe you, I will understand that how you did all the jobs before. So communication, presentation, enthusiasm are very important here. So if you say, okay, I have enough 15 years experience in my, what should I know? I need not to tell everything. I have everything, no, my friend. It is true. It is according to your country context, but when you are a new country, you need to make it clear and you need to make the noise. If you don't make the make noise in Canada, you don't exist in Canada. <laughs> so know the job prospects within your field of specialization, industry, location. Some jobs are different. Say for example, as I mentioned earlier, if you look for a mining engineering job, okay, if you live in Toronto, mining, there is no mining. Either you need to go to Sudbury, which is four hours north from Toronto, or you need to go to Alberta or somewhere else. Plus manufacturing, also there's some territorial growth. Okay, maybe north part of and west part. There's some industry preference. So these are the things we, we need to understand. And each and every job has a technical requirement. One of the most important thing I want to share with you that if you are planning to come to Canada or if you are in Canada, please look at your national occupational <coughs> code number, civil engineering electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, they have a different code, four digit or five digit code. But interestingly, under each code, there are at least 60 to 40 job titles. Now, if you look for a job as a civil engineer, you will be tired, millions of civil engineering job, but when you will read the job description, they will ask for something else. So this is one risk. The second risk, very few civil engineers job you may get. Because within the civil engineering, there are 60 job titles. Either you can say municipal engineer, tunnel engineer, highway engineer, construction engineer. So there are so many job titles. So when you know who you are, 
and what you're looking for, then you narrow down your job search. Otherwise, you'll get lost. You'll get lost with so much information. That is why it is important for you to understand what you're looking for. Plus, a random job search will not work here. It is your obligation to identify <coughs> your employer. If you are working in construction, okay, Acon, Acom, Elliston, Dragadels, JLL, SNC, there are hundred thousands of companies. If you look, look for the chemical engineering, then you need to identify your employer. If you are on the process improvement side, manufacturing side, maybe you can go with the consumer good products, say Lexon Smith, Johnson and Johnson, Hayes Canada, PepsiCo. There are so many things. So it is what I am trying to say. It is your obligation. First, you need to draw a line what you are good at and what you're looking for. Second thing, you identify who could be your potential employer. Then the third step is then you start looking for a job. But typically what I have seen that people come to Canada from the next day, they start applying for a job randomly. It, it will not give any result quickly. Plus as an engineering professional, you need to identify three things. As I mentioned earlier, what you are, your roadmap. Are you going for the core engineering? You are going to project management or you're going to technician and technologies. So customize your job search, random job search, I used to say the free size T-shirt is okay, but free size resume and biodata will not work here. Every time you need to customize your job search and you need to work accordingly. Remember, job search is a full-time job and have a plan. I do respect all the engineers and that is why I used to say, trust yourself. You are an achiever. You did so many things in your life. Just you need to prove it again here when you are new country, new environment, new standard. So that is why I, want to conclude here like this, compromise with the strategy, not with your goal. Today and tomorrow, you will be in your field. Just as a matter of time. Maybe it is a difficult time as at the beginning, but I do understand and I do respect as an engineer, as an engineer, you have the right knowledge, you have the right personality and the right attitude, but it's all about a strategy. Okay, if you want to get in touch with me, here is my contact info. You can take the screenshot or you can drop me a line or other ways. Or if you are in Canada or in Ontario, if you drop by to any of our office, you can Probably. ask to my office and they can direct me <coughs> you to my thing. And that's all from my end. Now uh, I am getting going back to Rana. Yes, hi. Thank you for uh, such an excellent presentation. We have a few questions I'm in, but uh, I love your analogy and your advice, you know, uh, customize, customize your resume. Uh, it's not uh, your analogy to a free size t-shirt <laughs> is excellent. And you uh, started off with an overview and went into specifics of programs and partnerships that uh, access employment offered, which is great. Costs, benefits, et cetera. And, um, you also brought up uh, specifics, uh, real life situations. For instance, if you're an oil and gas petroleum engineer, do your research, where are the jobs? So thank you, thank you for going to specifics and also offering an overview of uh, the programs provided by Access Employment. So we have a few questions that have come in. Um, so let's see, um, okay. So the first one is, um, is it impossible to secure employment with no prior experience in our field? So I'm going to assume that this is someone who's come in uh, from outside, an immigrant, and they have no prior experience, just education. What would uh, your advice be to them? Okay, simple. <laughs> this is a very common common trend nowadays. So many foreign trained, uh, I mean, the foreign students are also here. They Now, my friend, once you are in Canada, so remember, Nobody will ask about your education. Now I know when you completed your bachelor's or master's four years, five years. So you did some academic projects. Remember, you did some academic projects. So why not you reflect those academic projects in your resume in such a way that you did some hands-on? And there are always, always some entry-level jobs. It is, say for example, you completed your bachelor degree in mechanical engineering. So from tomorrow, if you come to Canada without experience, you cannot get a mechanical engineer. Maybe drafting, maybe design, maybe production associate, maybe lead hand, maybe. Um, there are so many other ways or QC assistant or QA assistant within the manufacturing. 
where you will be able to apply your engineering knowledge into the work. And then within one, six, seven months, your supervisor will notice that you have engineering knowledge and technical, how you can grow like this. So please don't feel pressure. If you come to Canada, bring some hands-on experience so that you can reflect it and the employer will be happy to. This is the way, somehow, some way we need to start, right? Great, and uh, a lot of people advise volunteering internships. Is that common in the uh, engineering? Uh, no, not voluntary. Like say, voluntary work in three different industries is very difficult. One is the engineering, second is the IT, and third is the HR. Because, because of the confidentiality reason, so it is not easy. Plus, when you go to, for the voluntary work in Canada, particularly in the construction sector, so you should have the insurance. Without insurance, you cannot go to the site because then health and safety hazard. So volunteering within construction or engineering is not that. But there are some programs which will allow you to practice like placement and co-op. So when you are here, you need to explore those kind of things. So that is why <clears throat> it is possible but what uh, uh, Ram said, very important, that before coming to Canada, if you can brush up your skills, remember, certificate is important, but for job, it is not that important. Here, for job, I need to ask, okay, do you know how to fix it? Don't give me the theory. You do it. Here is the difference. So before coming to Canada, do something for yourself, either tutorial or YouTube, somehow so that you can demonstrate that, okay, I have the hands on doing something. Okay, so there is a very specific question that's come in. I'm gonna ask you that question and ask you to respond to it more generally. So the question is, is there any path to move on from petroleum engineering to mining engineering in Ontario? So this is a very specific question, but my question is, well, you could answer that if that's something you want to do. But the other thing is, when you have such specific questions, where would you go to find the responses? Uh, I think uh, very, very rightly said, Rami, this is very difficult. Uh, first thing, petroleum engineer, chemical engineer, for them, those who are coming from the oil and gas industry from uh, other part of the world, always, always a challenge here in Canada, uh, particularly in Ontario. <clears throat> now, then the second question will come, okay, within the oil and gas industry, what did you do? Did you do the procurement? within the oil and gas, or did you do the quality control, or did you do the maintenance, or you did operation? So if I know what did you do within the oil and gas industry, then we can use those experience and bring back to you in a different industry. So here we have the some manufacturing industry. It could be food, it could be beverage, it could be electronics, it could be consumer good product. So you can use your production, operation, maintenance experience into other industry, which are very different because supply chain also industry is also very big in Ontario. So now these are the things before oil and gas, that's fine. It is your industry, but what is your specialization? What did you do within the oil and gas? Then we need to look for that niche area and then we need to look for why you can apply it within other industry, but it is possible. Maintenance could be one of the major uh, area where people, oil and gas people, they come into the maintenance field, industrial maintenance. So this is one. Second thing, the production experience. If you know, know the lean methodology, if you, know, if you know the Six Sigma or green certification, then you can use it to any other manufacturing field. So you need not to focus on the oil and gas. That's, that's the beauty. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I'm in Vancouver, Canada. How can I find an organization offering services such as yours here? No, I think it is it is very difficult. There's engineering a program. I know other provinces, it is almost impossible to get this kind of specialized support, but I will request West, uh, you can, my friend who is from Vancouver, you can drop me a line so I, I, I can look for it and I can think something different for you, especially. <clears throat> I'm also going to add, I used to work in a settlement agency at one point in my career. And what settlement agencies do is find one that offers career services and go 
to a career specialist or a counselor and ask them for that information. So, and make sure you find uh, specific guidance. And the other option is a lot of these settlement agencies can uh, connect you with mentors. So people in your field, if they have that person in their database. So connect with them, have a couple of conversations, see if they can help you make any connections, um, go with expectations, but definitely don't, uh, you know, um, I would say respect boundaries. Sometimes uh, I've been a mentor and if someone gets to be too pushy, it's very hard to help them. So I'm being very honest in saying that there are certain boundaries, um, but mentors are always there to help. You just need to find uh, the right one. There are a number of other questions. Um, mm -hmm. I'll go with one last one, which is, uh, which province has the easiest process for becoming an engineer? Okay. So this is a very uh, difficult question for me. <clears throat> I'm saying each and every province, they have their own territorial own regulatory process, territorial regulatory process. Nowadays, it's, there is a good thing is that in Ontario that previously we had one year of work experience in the respective field that has been now eliminated. So, however, there is uh, no shortcut process, but it's unofficial, my experience, then APG or like in <clears throat> Saskatchewan, Alberta, they are, they are a little faster compared to, compared to Ontario. This part I know, but it's my unofficial opinion. Okay, thank you so but, much. Thank you but so the, much. But the, question is, but the question is why you need to worry about the license? You don't need the license. Engineering is the only occupation in Canada. It's a regulated profession, but without license, you can practice engineering. The only difference is that maybe you will not be allowed to sign or contract anything. But millions and hundreds and thousands of people without professional engineering, they are practicing engineering and making 100, 300, 200K. So your initial target is not the licensee. Your initial target is to get the job first. License is the logical consequence and today and tomorrow it will come automatically. So you need not to look for the license first and then job. Then you need three, you, you, then you need to be rich. You need to bring money from home and you need to wait for three years to get the license. How you'll survive at this time? Yes, yes. Um, I, I would like to add, uh, a lot more and ask you a lot more questions, but we are uh, uh, going to uh, say thank you and uh, move to our uh, next uh, presentation. So thank you so much, Rizal. And uh, it was an thank excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. So uh, it's time to welcome our uh, next speakers uh, from the Ontario Association of Certified Engineering Technicians and Technologists. O A E C E T T O A C E T T. Sorry, that was O A C E T T. <laughs> We're uh, thrilled to welcome uh, Carol Warner and uh, Julia Farner. So, thank you so much for being here with us today and uh, sharing your expertise. I'm just going to uh, repeat that if you have questions, please uh, type them in the chat or uh, hit the QA button at the bottom of uh, the screen. So thank you, and uh, Carol, Julia, I'll let you um, move to your move on to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, hello everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. So we'll give you a bit of information about who OSED is. I know that um, we're going to skip over my picture. That's more than <laughs> more than fine. So who is OSED? Because I know this is a very long acronym. So we are the Ontario Association of Certified Engineering Technicians and Technologists. That's a long acronym and even longer name, but we actually, the name tells you exactly who we are and what we do, which is the beautiful part about it. So we're an association, we've been around since 1962, and we represent predominantly college educated engineers. However, there are many university educated engineers, especially people who are internationally educated that do join us as well. And I'll get into that more in a minute. We have 21,000 members across the province of Ontario. And our members could be anything from a student up to a retired member. Many of our members are actually professionals who hold uh, sort of positions of leadership in their companies. We represent 15 disciplines of engineering, technology, and applied science, and that, those I'll list in a minute. And our members work for over 5,000 companies. So a company could be anything from a consulting firm, um, a, private, a private company as well. And it could be a municipality. Many of our members are also, also work for the colleges because we do work with 24 colleges across the province. So just to give you an idea of the disciplines, and these are disciplines that OSET certifies for. 
So mechanical, civil, building, bioscience, electrical, these are some of the most popular disciplines just because these represent the majority of the jobs in this province. But we also certify for other ones, including chemical, electronics, mining, geological, environmental. That's something that I'm, is near and dear to Carol's heart for sure. So we'll just, uh, and she is a member as well as a staff member. So just to give you a bit of information as well. So I mentioned that we certify. So that is actually OSIT's main purpose as a professional association is to certify both engineering technicians and technologists. So we have two different <laughs> certifications that we certify for. And let me just get into the next thing. So why become certified with us? So the, I guess it was discussed about professional engineers and I saw in the chat as well, there were questions about the EIT. So from my understanding from the PEO website, EIT is no longer being awarded. So it's something you can't even join into the program. Carol could speak to that in more detail than I can. But to become a technologist or a technician, which you would become before you become a technologist, it is something that anyone could do as long as they meet the qualifications. And that's something that Carol will discuss. But why would you want to do that? Well, it may be a voluntary certification, but there's many reasons why it's a good thing to do. Here's just to give you an idea. Randstad Canada, they are a very, very large HR company. And of course, they do research into the market. So in 2020, they only do their these types of surveys every so many years. The it was, OSET was considered one of the top five most valuable engineering certifications to have. So that is definitely something to consider. What I would recommend people who are online today do Go on, go on websites, go on Indeed, go on other job sites and look up OSET and you'll see multiple job listings come up where OSET certification is either preferred or in many instances it's required as well. So that is something to consider. Even the Government of Canada Job Bank, if you, I know that someone, I know that the, the last speaker brought up national occupation codes, the NOC. So if you looked up NOCs for technicians and technologists, which many engineers sometimes go that route as well, if you actually look into the writing, they mentioned that it's a bonus to have an OSET certification. So let's just, so what do we do? Well, first of all, I mentioned that we have two certifications. So we certify, we certify technicians and engineering technologists. What else do we do? Well, unlike PEO, and I know there was a mention of OSPE, which is another engineering association based out of Ontario. The best thing about OSA is we're both of those combined into one. So we have the regulatory side and we also advocate. So we advocate on behalf of the profession to industry, to government, and we also make sure to build awareness to the public because oftentimes people don't know that engineering technologists and technicians are just as important as engineers. They may have a slightly different job. Does it mean they make less? It doesn't mean that they're less important, just as different. And what else do we do? We help members along the career path. So we have many members that join us as students. Of course, if you're internationally educated, you will have already completed your post-secondary education, in which case you usually join us as an internationally educated <laughs> professional. So I just wanna make note that this is an excellent category to join us under. OSIT was one of the first organizations that actually made sure that people that joined who are internationally educated did not require Canadian work experience. I know that recently PEO made those changes, but we actually made that change originally in 2016. So why certify with us? Well, there's actually many reasons. First, we're recognized throughout the province of Ontario. We're recognized by municipalities, by engineering companies, by even if people, if you, if for individuals that want to go teach at a college, we work with the 24 colleges across the province that offer engineering technology and technician programs. Another reason, competitive salary, and this is something I'll get into in a, into a moment. We do a salary survey, survey every few years, and we survey members and we survey companies, and they give us their results. And this is done by a third party. OSET is not the one conducting the survey, because you know if we did, people would be worried that it would be biased. But many of our professionals actually earn considerably more. So people who are certified often make more than those pe people that are not certified. Many companies also have policies where they say, if you, you make the extra step to show that you really are serious about your profession and you seek out certification, you get it, then that will often give you a, a salary bump at work. And of course, it's a mark of professional achievement. You're going above and beyond. So it's one thing to say, I have my degree, I have my work experience. It's another thing to say, you've gone above and beyond to become certified. And of course, <laughs> professional development. 
So we have professional development is a requirement to maintain your certification, but we also offer many, many opportunities, volunteer opportunities, whether it's on our board with our committees at the chapter level. And many of these are leadership style volunteer opportunities. So I know that it was mentioned how important it is to network. Volunteerism is a large part of networking. So you could go to an event where you're networking for a night, you meet a lot of people, but if you're volunteering, you get to know those individuals and it's those relationships that truly make the difference in a career. So as I mentioned before about our salary survey, it was completed by Environics. So the, this last survey was completed in 2022. So 71% of employers surveyed recognize OSIP membership and certification. That's, that's pretty big. And it means not only do they recognize that it, it, it makes a difference in terms of your salary. So something to consider. But now I'm going to hand the floor over to my colleague, Carol Warner, who's going to discuss her certification process. Thank you, Julia. Okay, get rid of that face, please. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Oh, I think we missed one. Go back one there. Oh, after me. Yep, thank you very much, Julia. So the second part of this, of course, is uh, certifying with OSET. So when you do certify with OSET, there is a membership category that everybody starts with, and that's the associate membership category. And this is very easy to get started and be at this level. So to become an associate, which again is the first step to be certified, we really only need basic documents. And so that would be a copy of proof of your legal name and making sure that you were 18 years of older. And then again, we'd also need proof of completion of at least one year post-secondary education in both the area of applied science or engineering technology. This can be international education, this can be Canadian education. And at this stage, we just need a copy of an unofficial transcript or even just a copy of your diploma. That would get you started as an associate member. Next slide, please. So once you become an associate and you want to work towards becoming certified, and as Julia had said, we do have two certifications, and that is this, these are protected titles, by the way. You can only use them if you've been certified. Uh, certified technician, which is CTEC, or a certified engineering technologist, which is a CET. And so when you're working towards getting certified, there are some further documentation that, uh, requirements that we do have, and those are official transcripts. If those transcripts aren't in English, they do need to be notarized and translated into English for us. You may have to provide us with an English language benchmark. We do need a resume and some job descriptions. And very important, we need references to support those job descriptions. Now, I'll just talk quickly again about this English language benchmark because it is something that's very important for those folks that are um, internationally educated. So both our certifications do require that you have a level seven of the Canadian le level uh, language benchmark. And of course, that's related to the folk, to the uh, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. Now, it's you know not to be frightened off that you have to get this test right away. This, this English language benchmark requirement can be met by one of three ways. So if you have completed a one-year post-secondary academic program in engineering or applied science here in Canada, then you would not need to do the test. You have met the benchmark. Another way is that there are some people that do complete their post-secondary in a country which is recognized as being at a similar level of English for Canada. And for instance, Bahamas, Guyana, Nigeria, the United States, of course, there's several uh, countries that do have the same level that we have. And if you had completed your education at one of those, you would not be required to do the English language benchmark. But if, if you did not hit one of those two scenarios above, we would require that you would provide us with a copy of a recognized English language benchmark test. It would have to be completed less than two years ago, which is very important. And you can see there that there are some um, exam providers that we do recognize. And not only does that test have to, be, have to be at that level of seven, but you had to make sure that each of the testings on there do show a pass and score because there are four sections. And we do have those scores on our website. Okay, so again, to be certified as a certified technician or certified engineering technologist, there's always two components. We are looking at your academics and we are looking at your experience. And so when it comes to experience, 
the majority of people do start off at the level of a certified technician. That is a technician level of experience. And so for that, you do have to have two years of work experience, and that does, we do consider international work experience as part of that. And basically, this is what you would do at the start of your career when you'd finish school. So, so some of the things that would be at the level of a technician, it's you know, you'd be performing duties under general supervision, and you'd be following established practices and clear-cut policy and the performance of the majority of your duties. Again, you would, um, you know, as an example of that, that uh, if you were following, um, you know, provincial legislation or, or, or guidelines, safety guidelines, again, and if you had an unusual problem to deal with, that would you would take to the supervisor. It wouldn't be something you do in your role. And so some of the activities that are examples of what a technician would be expected to do would be, of course, project coordination to supervise construction staff to review and approve drawings and permits, operational support, to do contract administration, and to do technical sales. And so above the certified technician is the level of a certified engineering technologist. So similar to the CTEC, again, you have to have at least 24 months or two years level of experience. And for a technologist, six months of that at least must be at the higher level of a technologist. And again, this is something that um, it's expected that as you progress through your career, that you will get to a technologist level to about two to three years of working with a technician level of experience. So overall, this is when you start to work independently and you have full responsibility for many stages of the work plan. You're gonna make some major decisions without your superiors, except of course, when it's large investments of money or, or real long-term programs are involved, then you still would likely get that um, guidance from your superior. And we do have some examples of some of the activities uh, equipment and process design, develop, developing solutions and implementing them, perhaps troubleshooting complex equipment, you provide supervision and management of staff teams, and you play a, a key role in long-term budget planning. Now, another requirement to be certified as either a CETEC or a CET is that you must pass our professional practice exam. So we have two versions of that exam currently. We have an internationally educated professional practice exam, and we have the regular professional practice exam. And basically, overall, the reason we need to pass these exams is they do demonstrate their awareness of legal and ethical responsibilities to the public employees and to yourself, which is the, which is the, the baseline of, of a regulator is to make sure that you're maintaining the safety of the public. And so for the internationally educated, even though the E says educated, it is related to experience. So if you've not completed one year of Canadian experience, you have the option to take this exam instead. And then of course the PPE is for those who completed one year of Canadian experience already. Both exams are multiple choice and they're written online with the proctor who does watch you through a webcam. And the PPE, the regular one, is three sections and three hours long. And the IE PPE is three and a half hours long with four sections. The one extra section we have on the IE PPE is the enhanced practice section. And it actually gives a really good example of what it's like to work in a Canadian workplace, because that can differ very much from, from the workplaces that you're uh, familiar with. So it has some extra questions on culture in the Canadian workplace, a little bit extra on health and safety. And, and overall, it's actually a very good section for anybody regardless, but it is something that is an option for those folks who have not had a chance to complete one year of Canadian education. Next slide, please. So this is the dreaded, uh, for any of you who are familiar with OSAT at all, uh, the technology report. This is something that's only required if you want to become a certified engineering technologist. So the technology report, really the purpose of it is, is for you to use that opportunity to effectively examine and describe an engineering or applied science technology pro, uh, problem. So it gives you the chance using your academics knowledge and your experience knowledge to put out a problem, give some hypothesis and data about it and prove that you know how to solve that problem. And 
the thing is with this with the technology report is it's often the last step of being certified as a CET. We do have some people that are that are quite excited about submitting that project because it sometimes can be the longest, as I said, the last step. But again, it can't be during our certification process. You can't submit it until after you've obviously become certified as CPEC and you've already had a file review done and you're not missing any academics. So again, it's, it's at the final stage. And to let you know too, for you folks that are um, becoming a CTEC, a certified technician, you do not need to complete a technology report. And just quickly, one other further thing about the technology report. Again, you know, it, it, it's about 20 pages long. We have a guideline document that would take you through the whole process. It's, it's not something to be um, intimidated by. We, we, we do help you on how to put that, to format that and put that together and let you know what the markers are looking for that are gonna review your document. And so the process for completing the technology report, if you look at those three red uh, boxes there, is the first step is that you submit the proposal. And the proposal is only a two page document and it's gonna say, this is what I'm gonna talk about. And it basically is your way of asking permission if it's okay to submit that report. Uh, OSET, we take that uh, proposal and we do review it, our admissions committee does, and that would be somebody in your discipline. So somebody who is fully knowledgeable about the problem that you're going to be talking about. And they provide you with the response within eight weeks if they've accepted that. Once you've got that acceptance, you have one full calendar year to then submit your report to us. And once your report is submitted and received by OSET, we do have a response in 16 weeks on whether that's been approved or not. And just uh, last one thing I, I wanted to do, and it's really, it's a great highlight for folks that are new to the country. And uh, it's something we, we hope will be advantageous to you and really make you consider coming to OSET is that if you do apply for your membership with us within one year of arriving in Canada, so you've got your passport stamped, you've got your work permit, your study permit, and it's been within one year, we will actually waive the application fee. So that does save you over $250, which is a very good savings. So that is something we do encourage you to take advantage of. Um, just a note to, to know though, that we do have annual membership dues. So if once you were accepted as a member, there would be the annual membership dues that are payable, but at least we are uh, assisting you in making it a bit more affordable by waiving the application fee. Great, thank you, Carol. So I'm just gonna go over a few other really, really quick items and then we'll go to questions. So how do you become a member? Very, very easy. So if you go to our OSET website, which has been revamped, which is happy days, you could actually even look up the certification process and get every, it gives you a lot of details, but it, we also have staff here to help. So you go to www.oset.org. There's a login button in the top right corner. If you click that, then you could start your profile and then you could, it would lead from there into an application should you be interested. So what are the other benefits of joining? Well, I'd mentioned before about meeting people, networking. So we have networking opportunities at OSET events. We did have an event for internationally educated professionals this past October. And um, I believe we had a representative from Access Employment who was there. So we did, we had two events. We had a day event and we had multiple speakers. It was virtual. So people to help with elevator pitches, um, letting you know about their Canadian journey so you could understand what they did to get a job and sort of be successful in Canada. We had another speaker discuss the accreditation process from World Education Services and a, a person who helped with LinkedIn and they had amazing suggestions. And the evening portion was in person. It was in the greater Toronto area. So I understand not everyone lives there, but we had at least 40 people come out who are internationally educated. We had 50 OSET members. We had our members do a speed mentorship. So they connected with a lot of these internationally educated professionals to give them career advice and specifically industry advice because all of our members are people working in the engineering technology and applied science industry. We also have chapters though. OSET has 27 chapters across the province of Ontario. They're all localized. So this is again, a great opportunity to network because you're part of a community. There's many, they have their own events throughout the year. You could even volunteer with the executive. Another bonus of joining as well, 
career enhancement. So in order to, to maintain your certification, once you become certified, you have to complete professional development. We offer a lot of free and really, really discounted professional development. For example, we have the full PMP course for about $600. I, it's very hard to find it at that price anywhere else. And then of course we have our job board. This, this is just, it's Canadian Technology Employment Network. This is just for OSET members. There's a lot of great opportunities that are posted on that board. And we have discounts. I mean, everyone likes to save money. I know that I do. We work with a company called Member Perks and they offer hundreds of discounts on anything from attractions, services, travel opportunities, even basic things like we have home and auto insurance, things that individuals need in their daily life. Oh, sorry. So this is just a testimonial from one of our members, Anil Kolasari. He actually has volunteered with us for many, many years at the chapter level. And he knew that volunteering actually helped him professionally and personally. He's made a lot of friends as well. And another a member of ours, both actually, who still volunteers. So they're going on a decade each of volunteering, Kassan. So they enjoy volunteering at the chapter level. They meet a lot of people, but again, it's enriched them professionally and personally. So we are here for you. And if you have any questions, I'm going to put, um, I'll put an email in the chat, which would be certified OSEP.org. So if you have any questions for us that you want to ask later on, please do, or otherwise I'll, I'll hand it over. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carol and Julia. That was uh, an excellent pre presentation with uh, a lot of uh, specifics. Uh, we have a few questions come in. But I would encourage everyone to go to OSET and uh, check out uh, the information. We've had a lot of information that uh, Carol and Julia have shared. So um, specific questions, but let me go to um, a more general questions at the beginning. So this is, um, do all provinces have organizations like OSET? Yes, they do. So all I can, all, and we also have a national association too called Technology Professionals Canada. So there are provincial associations in each province specifically for technicians and technologists. Great. Um, so someone's asking, I live in Vancouver. Can I apply for OSET instead of EGBC? So I don't know what EGBC is. They're all that you answer. <laughs> Is that the geoscientist, maybe? I'm not sure what the, the, the EG is. But yes, you can apply for, for membership with OSET from, oh yes, thank you, engineers and geoscientists. I had the geo right. <laughs> so, so yes, when, and we do have members that we have uh, a CET in Trinidad and Tobago. We do have uh, outside of province members. The only thing is, is that uh, your title is only protected in the province of Ontario. So you'd only be able to use uh, your CTEC or your CET while you were in Ontario, uh, not outside of the uh, province or the country. Thank you for that. So this is a tough one. I see a lot of engineers leaving Canada when they don't find suitable jobs at their level. Uh, do you see this changing? Well, I, I, Carol, I'll maybe say a few words and then if you want to chime in. Do, do we see this? It's a little bit different for technicians and technologists than engineers. The requirements are different oftentimes. So technicians and technologists, as we mentioned, we work with the, um, the 24 colleges across the province. Many of our members do have a university education, but the job roles for technicians and technologists are different than they are for engineers and the requirements even so even to practice in certain instances of, as a professional engineer and to sign off, you have to have your PNG. Yes. So our certification is something that is not necessarily a requirement, but it certainly, it looks really, really good on your LinkedIn and on your resume. It's a, it shows an employer that you've gone above and beyond. And a lot of employers do require it, but it's not a provincial requirement. I don't know, Carol, if you want it to. No, oh, thank you, Julie. Excellent answer. And, and Julie is exactly right. I mean, from a personal standpoint, as Julie had mentioned, I'm a, a certified technician in the environmental discipline, and I've been a CTEC since 2016. I, I've only been working with OSET since 2020, 
And the reason why I'm a C-Tech is because I have a, a geography degree from a university. I do not have an engineering degree. I didn't have the, truth be told, I didn't have the math skills to go into engineering. But anyways, I had that desire to work in the environmental field. So again, I have a Bachelor of Environmental Studies. So I do have an undergrad degree and that did make me um, eligible to be a certified technician or an engineering technologist. And before I joined OSET, I worked in the, the uh, municipal government for 17 years. And both of the, the roles as a project manager and as a supervisor, it was a requirement to be a certified member of OSET. So again, as Julia had said, it to be quite frank, I think it personally gives you more opportunities. I think sometimes the PN really limits because it has that more formal signing authority. I would say that being certified by OSET gives you more opportunities. It stretches across more disciplines. And I, I really do feel that it, it does open up more. You're not quite so pigeonholed by having one of our certifications. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing your personal experience. Um, so another question is, can you apply outside of Ontario if you're planning to move to the province shortly? <laughs> yes, no? yes, 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 again, please do, please do um, apply for uh, certification and you can mention, I would mention that you're going to be coming to our province shortly. Um, as uh, Julie had mentioned before, there are associations like ours across the entire country. And if you're in another province, I think I saw someone flash up that they're in New Brunswick. There is a New Brunswick Association of Technicians and Technologists. And if you wanted to apply to that province where you are to get a title, and then you decided a year from now, hey, you know what, I'm actually going to move to Ontario. It's very, very easy to transfer once you're certified as a technician or technologist in another province. We have an interprovincial transfer form, and it's a very easy process. And uh, it's something we see all the time. So definitely you can transfer province to province too. Okay, and um, can a bachelor's degree in engineering apply to be a CEP? Yes, correct, please. Yeah, we see a lot of people. Again, I have an undergrad degree, it's not an engineering degree, but it's, you know, our academic requirements are the equivalent, this is the minimum requirements and many go above it, are the equivalent to either a two-year Canadian post-secondary uh, diploma in engineering applied science and the for a technologist is the equivalency to a three-year post-secondary uh, college program so as long as you have that two-year or three-year now I will say that when you have an international uh, degree or diploma we do evaluate that against what that Canadian requirement would be so if you took a four-year degree from uh, a, a school uh, you know, in Kenya and some other country, again, we would have to evaluate that might not necessarily equate to a three year in Canada, but if it didn't, do not be discouraged because we assign academics. So if we have people that come and they're missing a course or two, we give them the opportunity and we tell them this is the missing course or two that we need you to take. And you can take that online at a college. We have technical exams. So we have, we don't want to discourage you if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, um, concerned you don't have enough education, don't let that discourage you from applying to us because we will tell you that and we will identify what's missing and we'll certainly help you to try to get those missing pieces. Thank you for that. And there are questions about the cost of membership. I believe Julia answered it's $25 uh, for student memberships. Is that correct, Julia? For student memberships, yeah. And that's the final price that includes tax and everything else is 75 a year. There are actually more perks to becoming a student member. So you go to our website and you look at the student membership, you get all the regular benefits I listed, but you get even more benefits because there's options for students to get a membership subsidy if they volunteer at the chapter level. So, so many other options. So we have student awards, student scholarships. It's definitely worth it to consider that. Okay, great. And um, this is a question on my mind also, actually. If... I have a WES academic evaluation for my credentials. Will that be counted? I would ask the same question. Yes, and, and we do uh, recommend, and we should have put that in the slide. If you do, if you have had a WES or another similar, like a, a TOEFL, another another similar 
um, evaluation of your credentials, please include that report. It's not mandatory, it just helps. And it might make it a bit quicker when they're looking at your transcript to try to look for that equivalency. Remember I told you that equivalency to a two-year or three-year? So the West does help. It's not mandatory, but if you have it, I would say submit it. Okay, great. Um, so someone's saying we shared the price for student membership, the cost of student membership. What about the others? I'm sure it's on your website, but uh, great if you want to share it. Yeah, all of the fees are. I could share a link to that. And I also saw the question about EIT or CET about which to pursue. I mean, it's really EIT, from my understanding, Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, is no longer, PEO is no longer allowing new applicants to EIT. That's correct. Yeah. So... I hope hopefully that answers that question as well, but I'll, I'll give a link to our website, which will include the link to our fee category as well. So you could see the different fees. Great, thank you so much. Um, are there any specific questions? Looks like Julia, you're looking at the chat. There are a number of specific questions. Is there anything else you would like to answer? Uh, there's a question that's I'm st currently studying construction project management, Canada or College North Bay. Can I apply for CET? I would think yes, based on what. Oh, yes, we see that. We see that course all the time from Canada. So absolutely. And you can either apply um, with the civil discipline or building discipline. Yeah, two, if, you, if it's a two year program, it'd be technician. If it was a three year program, it'd be technologist. But okay. if, you're, if you're still studying, I think the person said they're currently studying. So oh, you would first have to join us. Oh, as a student, as a student. and then and then you would have then you could start working towards mm -hmm. your certification as a student. So sorry. Okay. So I'm going to follow the thread of this question. Uh, if I'm a CET in other province and I move to Ontario, will that be counted transferred? Um, we have a, if maybe Julia, you could please put the, there's a web page about transferring membership. So yes, if you're, if you're a CET in another province right now, there is um, an interprovincial transfer form and you could transfer again. It's very easy to transfer to us. So you don't have to write your ethics exam again. We don't require the same documents, but um, I would always suggest we do a web page about it, which Julia will give you, but also contact your provincial association and let them know, you know, I'm interested in transferring to OSET. And it's, we all use the same form, uh, every province in the country. Okay, great. So um, I think that's it for now. If you have other questions, uh, please email our colleagues at OSET directly. They've shared their contact information. Um, and any final words, uh, Carol, Julia, before we wrap up? Um, no, just thank you for having us. Carol, did you have any other? final words. Oh, thank you. Uh, again, just like Julia said, thank you for this opportunity. And um, I'd encourage everyone to please reach out and uh, apply. It does make, you know, personally speaking, it's made a big difference in my career, even my career coming here to OSET. But I do have a real sense of pride that I know I worked really hard to get my designation. And once you've had it, it's a great sense of accomplishment. So I would encourage everyone to take advantage of that. Actually, in fact, my daughter's a student member too. So there you go. Two generations. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you for all that positive energy that you've brought to our conversation today and uh, the details that you've uh, provided us. Um, so that uh, that was great. We'll uh, wrap up now. Um, there have been questions about uh, recording. And yes, the session has been recorded, is being recorded, and will be posted on YouTube. It's currently streaming on YouTube, on our website. So you can definitely, you know, um, go to our website, look at webinars and find the recorded version. So thank you to everyone to uh, for attending our web conference series uh, organized in partnership with Access Employment. Special thanks to Rezo, Carol and Julia for your uh, skills uh, and expertise and uh, bringing them uh, to this conversation. And uh, thanks again to our sponsor, uh, Access Employment. So as I said, if you missed anything, uh, please find the webinar recording on our website and uh, share it with uh, friends or uh, other colleagues who've not been able to make the event. 
So, um, and if there's anything for us, suggestions, uh, you can also write to us at info at CanadianImmigrant.ca. Well, one reminder before we go, our last, uh, uh, we have one more web conference this year, uh, and that is starting your own business and happening on the 30th of November. So what I've seen is a lot of newcomers come to the country and they do start um, their own businesses. So if you're an engineer, you get certified, there are different pathways for you. You could find a position, you could start up your own uh, enterprise. So, I mean, the sky's the limit. It's, you know, up to you to uh, dream and uh, to go for it. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so uh, keep posted, sign up for our, for our newsletter. Uh, we share all our events uh, on our newsletter and you can sign up for it on our website. So thank you to our dear speakers and also for um, the participants. Um, we hope uh, to see you at our next webinar. Take care. Thank you. Bye.